So let's talk a little bit. This is my plan for what we're going to talk about this evening. So I'm going to give you some context overall about the Beck Initiative uh, and the work that we've been doing here in Philadelphia and more broadly. And then that'll be very brief. And then I'm going to spend some time talking about this idea of goal-directed CBT. So CBT, traditional CBT, but with a twist to it that has to do with adding a context that's really helpful in engagement and motivation. We're going to talk about the problem with silos, which I'll explain when we get there. And then we'll talk about using an overall therapeutic milieu as a way to deliver treatment so that it's not just within the traditional context of a one-to-one -one therapy relationship, but in fact, it's sort of a much more broad way of approaching treatment. And then I'll talk briefly about the work we've been doing that has to do with continuity of care across networks. I hope that's what you came to hear about, because those are the slides I've brought you. So, okay, context. Let me tell you a little bit about the Beck Initiative. The Beck Initiative uh, is a collaborative clinical, educational, and administrative partnership that we have with four groups of stakeholders. We've been doing this here in Philadelphia since 2007. Uh, when I say we, I'm talking about the Beck Psychopathology Research Center at Penn. That's uh, where my team and I, some of whom are here today, that's where we, uh, that's where we are when we do our work. We're partnered with the Philadelphia Department of Behavioral, uh, Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities, DBH-IDS. So this is really very much an academic public partnership. And then the other two stakeholder groups that we have are the providers who are providing these services and who we work with to uh, bring this out to the community, and the persons in recovery in the network. I'm not going to read you all of this mission statement. It's in the slides that you have. What I'm going to do is tell you really what the spirit of this mission statement is. We really see the work as we do as a social justice issue. There are, there are wonderful treatments that have been developed in academia, and we've lagged behind in bringing those to the community where everyone can access those, rather than folks who only have access to either uh, private practice, which can sometimes be too expensive for folks in the community, or who can access things in academia. So we're really focused on bringing some of this evidence-based, excellent care out to the community where people can access it. Very briefly, here's my team. As I said, some of them are in the room here. These are the instructors that come out uh, to do the training. And at the center, you'll see Dr. Aaron Beck. He's the lead of our center, and he's very closely involved in the work that we do. And this is the team from the Department of Behavioral Health here in the city that we've been partnering with. Here are the other two stakeholders and who we partner with. So when I list the levels of care here, these are examples of the levels of care that we've been engaged in here in the network. But in other words, that is the providers that we're partnering with. And I'll give you some numbers in a little bit about how many of those there are. But in fact, sort of the sneak preview of that is we have 46 programs that we've partnered with so, so far here in Philadelphia, and we add more each year. And then in terms of the people receiving services, the persons in recovery, we are sort of agnostic about which population we work with. So we work with adults, adolescents, children, folks with chronic homelessness, folks with severe and persistent mental illness, folks who are attending treatment in outpatient, where they have a variety of different things that they're presenting with. So we really have looked at how to take this treatment and bring it broadly to people so that they can access the services. Here are the numbers that I said I was referring to. So 46 programs across Philadelphia so far. We have trained clinicians in an intensive training. I'll talk more about what that model looks like when I get into the details. But almost 400 clinicians since 2007 have been trained in an intensive model um, with a standard that matches that of the academy. Actually, we use the same measure and the same cutoffs for that. On top of that, we've trained another 360 milieu providers. So those are people who you might not traditionally think of as someone who provides services or therapy. For example, um, we're working here at Friends Hospital. It was a lucky coincidence that we were able to present here as well. And here at Friends Hospital, we're training nurses. We're, we're training the techs who spend the day on the unit with the kids in, uh, that are receiving services here. We're training, uh, we've trained folks who provide meals on the unit. So we really are looking at how do we create a therapeutic milieu that embraces this as a culture rather than 
silos of information. We've also trained 72 administrators across the network, including more than 40 folks who are supervisors who we've trained specifically in how to supervise this work. So it gives you a sense of sort of the, the scope so far. So now let's talk about this, goal, this idea of goal-directed CBT. So this is not um, a spin-off of CBT. This is traditional Beckian cognitive therapy. And we've created a context around it that has to do with helping folks identify the goals that they have that are meaningful to them and work toward those as a reason to engage in CT. So this goal-directed CBT approach has three pillars to it, as you can see here. So let me talk about what those are. First, we're very goal-directed. So we work with folks, we train people providing services to work with folks to identify meaningful personal goals that they have. So these are not just the traditional therapy goals where if you ask uh, a child here at Friends who's been in treatment a number of times what their therapy goals are, we're going to get answers like, I want to be able to be medication compliant and I want to control my anger. These are kids who know what the right answer is, um, and I'm talking about kids, but adults as well. They know what the right answer is, but they might not be sort of emotionally engaged in that. So instead, we're talking about real goals, sort of bringing back the meaning of that word goals and asking about what actually has personal meaning to them and then how can we use these CBT skills to help them take concrete steps forward toward the goals that they have. We're very case conceptualization driven. There's a case conceptualization that is constantly updated for anybody who's receiving these services because what we don't teach is a manualized intervention. Instead, we're teaching the principles that underlie those manuals that are the core of cognitive therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. And we use those to create case conceptualization that then helps us with intervention selection and guiding treatment. So I'm going to talk more about that. That's our, our second pillar. And our third is that we have a really strong resilience and recovery focus. So rather than thinking about treatment as a way to shrink symptoms, we look at CBT as a way to build self and wellness and help people move toward those goals using very traditional, clear CBT techniques to do that. So let me give you an example of what that might actually look like in terms of the goal-directed piece. So in essence, as I said, we're asking folks what it is that's truly personally meaningful and important to them and then turning those into treatment goals that are, me that are meaningful and achievable even in a short period of time. So let's talk about what that looks like. We start with very simply asking folks, tell me what's important to you. We, don't, we often don't say, tell me about what your goals are because we are likely to get those sort of more canned or right answers. So instead, we'll ask about what are you interested in? What would you like your life to look like? What would you like to have in your life or not have in your life moving forward? And then we help clarify. We get very broad answers, understandably. But then we help to clarify what it is about those goals that are meaningful and important to that person. What makes that valuable to them? And then, um, and in fact, we even have folks do vision boards as a way to make that really concrete. We're doing a lot of that here at France. Once we know what they want, we frame things that are traditional treatment targets, symptoms, um, disorder, impairment, distress, as things that are getting in the way right now of the individual meeting the goals that they have. So um, tell me about how does, how does the anger get in the way of you being able to reach goal X? Or, when you're feeling really sad, does it make it harder for you to move toward that goal that you have of such and such? We then ultimately translate this into goal-directed CBT targets. So how can, what, would, what do you want? What's getting in the way? How can we help you get there? 
And it's that third piece, how can we help you get there, that opens the door for CBT in a way where we're using CBT case conceptualization and strategies mm -hmm. to help people move towards something that they're authentically engaged in and motivated toward. So to talk a little more about that, Sometimes when I start to present this to folks, I get a hand up in the audience that says, well, yeah, but what about kids or adults who say, my goal is, and then it's something unrealistic. We never say no to a goal. I don't want to be the person who said no once I really asked, tell me what's important to you. So instead, what we do <coughs> is we break those long-term goals into small, short-term steps. So I have, I have some examples for you here. And we would need to do that whether it was unrealistic or not. Because if we're talking about long-term meaningful goals, we're not likely to get to that in the next three months. So no matter what, we're going to be breaking them into smaller goals. So I have some examples here. What if a kiddo says to me, I want to be present? That's great. What would be some of the important skills that you might need to get to be president? Well, and we'll do some guided discovery around the fact that getting along with others uh, is really important if you're aiming to ultimately make your way through politics and be president of the United States. Negotiating well, staying calm in a crisis. You know what else people really like in their president? I've looked closely. One of the things they really like is someone who gets out of bed every day and showers and brushes their teeth. That is a meaningful step toward becoming president if that's what they want. And so we don't make promises that they'll become president, but we do figure out what the concrete immediate steps are and move toward them. You can see, I won't read through all the other examples here, but I have ways that we help people think about, you know, I want to be a football player, I want to be the next American Idol. Whatever that goal is, if it's unrealistic, I will still say yes, because who am I to decide what someone's limits are? And instead we frame it as something that's meaningfully, personally important. Another question I get about this sometimes is, what if the goal is a really bad idea? And uh, truly, someone said to me, what if I'm working with someone and they say, I want to be the most infamous serial killer in the world? Do you say no? And they thought they, they got me, I think. I don't say no to people's goals. I also don't promise that the goals will come true. What we do is say, tell me about what would be really important to you about that. What would be meaningful to you about that? So for example, if we really do some guided discovery of, around what that would mean for them, for one person, being the most notorious serial killer in the world might mean that you're powerful, you feel important, that you feel like you're protected from ever being a victim, and that people will remember you. Uh, the other examples I have here, kids, kids or, or adults, will say, I want to be a drug dealer, because that is how I see people get out of my neighbor, neighborhood. That's what I want to do. OK, well, you know, you need a really entrepreneurial spirit in order to do that successfully. Let's talk about how you can do that. Uh, you know, it would mean I'd be respect, respected and socially connected and powerful. Those goals I can get behind. And when we fill these needs in a much more immediate way, the long term of I want to be a serial killer, I want to be a drug dealer, I want to be left alone forever and ever is that third one. I just want people to leave me alone. When we can help people meet those goals in a way that's a little more pro-social than some of those things, then we're fulfilling, we're helping them fulfill what the need was. One more sort of complicated thing that sometimes happens with this kind of orientation is what if someone can't identify goals? So this is someone who's really depressed, for example, where they say, I'll be dead in a year. I don't need to, that's my goal. I want to, I want to not be here in a year. So these are the kinds of guided discovery questions we might ask them to help them hone in on what it is that's important to them about that. That's what this all comes down to. So what kind of things get in the way of you being able to even imagine a life that's longer than a year from now? Can you imagine what it would be like to be able to have goals? Even that is sometimes really anxiety provoking for people. So that might be our first step in treatment is could we work together on imagining your world where there's room for you to have goals that are more than a year away. So we've been talking about broad, long-term goals that we get people on board with, but clearly those are not the kind of goals that we have when we're doing CBT, or these sort of vague, very long-term goals. So instead, 
we start with those so that we have engagement, and then we work our way back into smaller and smaller steps that become, as you back away from the long goal and closer to the now, we start looking for what, are, what is the first step on your journey toward being president. As I said, people really like a president who showers and brushes their teeth every day. So could we work on that as a first goal? Now engagement around that goal is really different than engagement around that goal because people say you have to get out of bed every morning and take a shower and brush your teeth. The engagement piece is really different. But we still work them back so that we have these very concrete goals that can be done in a reasonable amount of time. Oftentimes, three months is a good rule of thumb, although it depends. If you're in an acute inpatient unit, you might not have three months. So there it would be, what's one step we can take while you're here that moves you toward that goal? And that becomes the treatment goal that we're working toward. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, OK. So now that we have goals and engagement on board, this is where we bring in our traditional, strong, evidence-based CBT. So the presenting problems that this person came into treatment with, whatever they are, get framed as challenges that the individual faces in reaching those short and long-term goals. So now when we're starting to do a specific intervention and we're trying to make sure that the person receiving services is on board with us and is really engaged and motivated, as I said, it's different to say, could we work on um, being able to work well with others because that's really important when you're in the NFL. That's a different level of motivation than let's do this because someone told you that this is what needs to happen. And so now we start to talk about you know, how might the suicidal thinking, the drug use, the fighting be getting in the way of you reaching your goals or how might ha having less of those things help you move toward those goals. We use case conceptualization then to be able to think about what's going on with this person, what is their history, what are their patterns of thinking and feeling and behaving, their deeper level beliefs. How are those feeding into the challenges right now? That are, that are in the way of the next step toward the goal. We use CBT interventions to help shift those patterns in service of the short-term goals, which are then in service of the longer term. So that's our goal-directed piece. It's the context in which we're doing the CBT work and training. So I'm talking about that as a model, but the other important piece here of the work that, that we've been doing is that we're very implementation focused. So what I just described is not something that we're doing in-house at Penn in an ivory tower where we practice it ourselves, but it's really important to us to bring it to the community. And in fact, our move in that direction toward, these goal, toward this goal-directed approach came very directly from people who we were training where we said to them, how does this fit for you in your setting and the work that you do and the people that you work with? And they gave us a lot of feedback about, some, about needing something that had to do with really inspiring hope and engagement and, and meaning and values. And so that's where that context was built from. So let's talk about how we bring this now out to the community. Doing a quick time check. All right. So, Oftentimes, for, I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of the time here talking about how we do this in the milieu setting, because I think that doing this in a traditional one-on-one -on -one setting is incredibly important and foundational to this work, but probably not the unique thing that we're doing. So I want to talk about how we do it more broadly. So when we come into a milieu context, and what I mean when I say milieu context is somewhere where treatment is being done where it's not solely based on individual one-to-one -one sessions, but instead there is a context, a program. So uh, the, the inpatient unit here, and there's a second one in the city that we're working with, are a good example of somewhere where there's a context for treatment rather than just individual. Another, there are lots of examples, um, intensive outpatient programs where people might be there from eight to three. There's a context rather than just one-on-one. -on -one. Residential settings uh, for chronic homelessness, for kids. So anywhere where we have that context, um, oftentimes that goes underutilized. Uh, we do traditionally, and in the past our program did, a lot of training that was directly with 
individual therapists and sometimes group therapists, but this, this greater context went really underutilized, and that's who clients spend the most time with when they're in those settings, is the people who are in the context and in the day-to-day -day with them. And so we wanted to think about ways to really capitalize on that and bring them into the same lens and shared language that the individual therapists might have. So help them see the people that they're serving in that same light, like through a case conceptualization to understand that the behavior and the reactions and the patterns of thinking that we were seeing. Typically, when you go into a milieu context like that, um, what we see are silos of knowledge and expertise. So for example, the nurses know nursing really well. And the psychiatrist knows psychiatry really well, social work, the techs on the floor, you get, the, you get where I'm going with that. There are each these individual silos of knowledge and expertise. And for someone receiving services there, that can be really confusing. Because within one discipline, well, first of all, discipline by discipline, they might have a different lens for seeing the people that they're working with, right? When you're trained as a nurse, you're trained to understand people's behavior in a very different way than if you're a social worker or a psychiatrist or the person delivering meals on the unit. So those are silos of expertise by discipline. And then one beyond that is even within a discipline, we don't necessarily have a cohesive way of looking at what's going on. People come from doctoral and masters and bachelors and associates level programs, trained in whatever model they were trained in, but then they come together in this context. And oftentimes there hasn't been a lot of communication about how the team understands behavior. So then for the person receiving services, it's really confusing. Because when they talk to this person, they're hearing one thing and having one kind of interaction. And then when they talk to this person, they're having a very different experience. And so the continuity of the experience of care there is not continuous. It's very disjointed and confusing. And so we've been looking at ways to bring CBT in as the shared lens and the shared language so that we go from silos to one program that works cohesively. So here's a traditional model of doing this. And uh, this has done, been done broadly. And frankly, in the early years of when we were doing this, this is a lot of what we were doing. Uh, so oftentimes, the focus on training people in CBT is on therapists, right? And so we think about a traditional therapy hour, for example. So we might train people to do individual or group or family therapy. And if we're doing this well, then we're also teaching them about the integration of assessment into that kind of work. And sometimes when we're doing that, we also pull in leadership in the place that we're going because we want to have them um, clearly state their support for the program. Without that, it falls apart. We need their help in coordinating logistics. So we have administration on board to sort of um, do the logistics, and then we have the therapists that we train. So we started in that place, but what we realized over time was that we were actually just perpetuating the silos. Because what we were doing was training the therapists to do this really well, and their administration had some awareness, sort of like the three second description of, of what the work is, but not a meaningful understanding. And we were missing all of the context and all the opportunities that were in that. So we decided to do it differently. So let's talk about how we take this and create a shared lens and a shared language and understanding among all of the team members. So here is typically what we think of as a milieu or a team. And the reason I'm really emphasizing typically is that we tailor this for where we're going. So this, look, this is what it would look like in an inpatient milieu. If we were in a school, for example, instead what you would see up there are um, certainly the people who are there in a clinical service, whether those are guidance counselors or a satellite clinic, whoever the sort of traditional person is that we would train. But in addition, when we're doing this, you might see teachers and classroom aides and the school nurse and 
oh, definitely the people at lunch and recess. That's really essential. Because the less supervised kids are, the more likely we're, we are to see some of the problematic behaviors. So we need to catch the, the folks who are there in those contexts to be able to support this model in the same way. So that's the milieu. Here on an inpatient unit, as my example, let me tell you a little bit about what that looks like. So one component of what we do, I don't know if I'd call it the central component, but it's one of the three pillars anyway, it's one of the three central components, is case conceptualization. All of our work starts there, always, all the time, regardless of context. So we train a core group of people to do case conceptualization for everyone receiving services. So that certainly includes this bottom group who are the folks that we traditionally think of as who we would train. But we've added this second circle, which is the adjunctive services. So not just the people who traditionally do therapy, but also folks like we, we have a lot of expressive arts therapists, for example, who we train. Um, there are there are a lot of settings that we go to who have spiritual care as one of the options that's available on the unit. Uh, it, in child-oriented services, there'll be somebody to provide education if it's a long-term milieu setting like this, uh, like partial hospitalization or an inpatient, or if this is in a school. So those are all folks who are very able to learn case conceptualization, but where oftentimes we don't capitalize on that. So we train them in that as well. The rest of the folks who are part of the milieu, we train to be good consumers of case conceptualization. So now we're talking about, first of all, team leadership. We don't only need them to sort of give their stamp of approval and um, then help us secure a room. We really need that, that's always an issue. But on top of that, we need them to have a working language that's consistent with what we're teaching the rest of the team so that we can start to build this idea of a program that's cohesive. So we're teaching administration, psychiatrists, the charge nurse, the lead techs, they all need to be good consumers of case conceptualization. And then let's talk about the milieu staff who often get overlooked. They are who folks who are in a treatment milieu spend the most time with. This is nurses and techs and aides, students, so like the intern who's there for a semester, they spend their time on the unit. We need them to be good consumers of this information so that they then start to develop this shared language and shared lens with the rest of the team. We then, once we have that shared context, we come back, we certainly pay lots of attention to the folks that we talked about that we traditionally train, so we train therapists, case management, anyone who we can recruit to learn the, the, um, not only the foundational skills, but also the more complex skills around designing and, and delivering cognitive and behavioral interventions and then following up to help kids take meaning from the experiences that they're having from the new interventions. We train them in group and individual and family therapy that is CBT and case conceptualization driven, connected to the meaningful goals that these kids have. On top of that, we're training everyone so that there is this shared language to support this goal-directed CBT milieu. So for example, on an inpatient unit, we're training the techs who spend every day with the clients to understand, to understand the goal-directed orientation, know that this, this um, consumer has worked with an individual therapist or in a group to start to identify meaningful goals and they'll know what those goals are. So that when there's a moment on this unit or in the context where, some, where a fight breaks out, for example, work, when the techs get in and, and pull that fight apart because that's part of their job, one of the things they can be doing is saying, Whoa, wait a minute, you were telling me you wanted to be president. This is not a good, this is not helpful negotiation. Let's think about some of the skills that you've been learning. How can you use them here? They're supporting the skills and the goal-oriented piece so that this becomes a rich context. One more piece we're thinking about in the milieu. We come back to team leadership. 
So when we have a milieu, another place we have an opportunity to really infuse this is in things like treatment rounds, treatment planning, discharge, when folks give report between shifts. All of those are opportunities for this to be infused. So one of the things that we've been doing here on the unit and at uh, Belmont Hospital, the other hospital that we're working with in the city, is um, we have been integrating this into each of the treatment team meetings that the psychiatrist holds with the heads of the disciplines. So that when they're thinking about what uh, the progress that someone has made, for example, it's in the context of both what their goals are and the case conceptualization. When they're thinking about problems that folks have been having on the unit, it's understood within this context. And all of this, when we do it, it probably is almost implied in what I'm saying. I'm not talking about training that's just workshops, right? Because when we do just a workshop, obviously this won't be the case today because you're all deeply engaged in what I'm saying. But uh, when we do these workshops, if you do a workshop and then you're not there to support the skills as people start to practice them, what happens is they leave really excited after the workshop because they're really invigorated by these new ideas. And then when they get back to work and they're in the face of the day-to-day -day and the demands, they might think to themselves, oh, I really wish I could use that thing I learned in the workshop. But without support for that, what we know from the literature is that those acquired, the, the acquired knowledge doesn't necessarily turn into new skill. It disappears. So when we do this, we do intense workshop in the beginning to give the knowledge base, and then we support this by consultation for anywhere between six and 12 months on average, where we're on the unit and doing some in vivo observation, and then able to give feedback in the moment or immediately after the moment about what someone could, did really well and what they might try differently next time. So this kind of picture where we're really pulling in each of the, the components of that milieu, that's what leads to this shared lens and unified approach, is that we have everybody working together, understanding consumers in the same way, and being able to uh, support intervention so that it really becomes a treatment milieu rather than a holding place. Let's see, I probably said all of this already. So my, my diagram here is just to bring the point home in terms of we start with many little lenses where each person is interacting with a consumer or a client in a way that makes sense to them given their training. And then we've moved this to a single lens so that it becomes more cohesive. We move away from silos of, of expertise and start to create a program that's really um, cohesive. One more piece that I haven't said about this, so, and this has to do with continuity, which we'll spend a little time on at the end. So we've talked about the very long-term goals, how they get broken down into shorter and shorter concrete small goals until they become a meaningful, achievable goal in a, in a short period of time, often three months. So what that leaves room for is after you've met that goal, now there's the opportunity to set the next one and move toward it, next one and move toward it. So when we're doing that, that creates this sense of hope because we start achieving goals in a meaningful amount of time and that are concrete and measurable enough that we're able to really look at them and say, wow, here's where we started. What do you make of the fact that three months later you're in this different place? The nice thing about that is that when we hit the end of treatment and we're, getting, we're starting to plan for discharge, this idea continues because the long-term goal, we very, very, very likely haven't reached it, almost never. And so in the, instead, being able to say, okay, we're getting close to discharge, what do you think your next step is? What would you like to achieve next? How do we plan for ways that you can continue to move toward that goal when we're not meeting anymore? So that might be support in the next level of care. That might be that they're not moving to another level of care, but that they're ready to be independent. And so helping them plan toward that, that comes back to this very sort of wellness and resilience idea about people becoming empowered to continue to move toward their goals on their own or with support if they continue to need it. Okay, so that's our model.
Now I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit more specifically about how on earth we train all those folks to do that and how we do it while they're busy doing their jobs. Because those are both, I think, really important pieces in thinking about this. So when we're talking about how we train that, that um, sort of traditional core group, therapists and or case managers who we th typically think of as doing therapy, just to give you a sense of that, starts typically with about a 22-hour workshop. So it's a time investment. Um, that's not 22 hours straight. Uh, it's, it's often over four or five weeks. But when we're in a milieu, what we find is that doing it in chunks that are about two hours works really well. Because folks are either at work, which means they need to be on the unit or in the school, or they're not working anymore, and then they'd like to go home. Uh, imagine that. So instead, when we break it down into about two hour pieces and we overlap it around shift change, having folks come in an hour early or stay an hour late becomes a little more feasible and we're able to do that. And then we offer it multiple times to be able to capture different shifts and folks who work weekends, for example, versus during the week. We then, as I said, we do consultation to help support uh, the knowledge acquisition. So we're doing six months of weekly consultation with tape review for these folks. We have them submit at least 15 work samples so we can hear their growing and developing skill. Uh, as I said, we're on the unit, and so we're able to see in the moment how it's going, be able to give feedback in a way that's not obtrusive would be not that helpful for, some, for one of us to stand next to um, a tech and say, no, 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 don't do that that way. Do this this other way instead. That's very antithetical to who we are. But instead saying afterwards, what did you think about how that went? What it, I wonder if we could think about some of the other things we've been talking about and whether this is an opportunity for that, being planful around the intervention and sending them out to do it. Sounds like how we do an intervention in session individually, right? This maps pretty cleanly onto that around the guided discovery for them to figure out for themselves that there's something that could potentially be a little different, helping them feel a sense of mastery and starting to think of ways they could do it differently, have them go try it out like a behavioral experiment, come back and talk to us about how it's gone. Okay, so lots of that. We assess competence with the CTRS, the Cognitive Therapy Rating Scale, which is the gold standard measure of competency. And we use a total score of 40 as the cutoff, which is the cutoff that's used in the clinical trials and in the academy. We do lots of calibration behind the scenes, which I won't get into right now to make sure that those, that those scores are meaningful. And we also require that they actually come to the workshop and, and the groups. If they do that, we provide a certificate of competency in CBT in a community setting, which is recognized through the DBH, the um, Community Mental Health Network here. So we've done workshop, we've done supportive skill, and then once we're done doing that training, we phase ourselves out and have an ongoing internal supervision group continue because we're really interested in sustainability. So if we come in and we do this training and then we disappear, we, without building a support system for that to continue, it falls. So instead, over the six months, we start to become a little less active so that they step forward to run that ongoing group, and then we step out, and the group continues. We offer recertification every two years and some other things that I think I'll talk about a little later. Um, I will do much more briefly the other trainings that we do, because that was sort of the core. With those adjunctive services I talked about, where we want to train them in case conceptualization, but, but, uh, but for folks where it's not the right fit for them to do the full training, they, have a sh um, they can come to the full training if they want to learn to do it, or we do something shorter around case conceptualization, basic principles, and how to integrate this within the scope of their work. So within the spiritual counseling, within um, dance and movement therapy, we talk about how do these principles become a lens for you to understand the folks that you're interacting with. And then we do similar weekly consultation, and we pull back, and the ongoing internal group continues. In training the staff, short, a shorter workshop, about eight hours. You know, it's interesting. What we anticipated was that we would get some pushback, frankly, from the folks in the milieu, that, they, that traditionally they're not thought of this way, and that they would see this as not their job and not within the scope. What we have found is that the milieu staff are so hungry for this. We get such great um, participation and feedback, but even milieu staff from other units coming to us and saying, I hear what you're doing over there. Can I come? Um, we have 
from, from the instructors who are here in the room. We have folks uh, where we're thinking about how to get not just first shift, but second and third, and where we say, you know, let's think about how we can schedule this. When do we need to come to catch third shift? And truly, they, we have a, a number of million staff who say, I'll come when you're doing it, and they're giving up sleep to come. They've been so hungry for this. So that's been a really exciting development on our end. So we do, again, workshop on the principles, being a good consumer and understanding that language and lens, weekly consultation. On top of that, one more piece, we're also training supervisors in the milieu because when, if we train all these folks but not the people who supervise them, it's understandable they want to have a sense of mastery and expertise above and beyond the people they supervise. Otherwise, it's awkward for the supervisory relationship. So we, sp we pay special attention to supervisors about how to supervise it. And then here's how we do um, team leadership. So one more time, short workshop for the principals and then check in with them regularly about how this is working for them. This is also where we have the opportunity to see how it's being integrated into all of these places. Document this gets um, infused into documentation, into hiring, into job performance. So again, this goes back to thinking programmatically rather than in silos. OK. Um, so that's sort of the layout, a brief one, of how we go about infusing this in a unit. When we do all of that, sustainability is really an essential piece of what we do, because otherwise, you can see that this is a huge investment from staff, administration, from the Department of Behavioral Health who's supporting this, and from us. And so it's really important, coming back to the social justice piece, that not only do we go in and do the training and sort of shift the milieu, but that that stays and grows and flourishes after we've left. So we spend a lot of time thinking about sustainability from the very beginning stages of our work with, with these different programs. So in fact, we're building in sustainability from day one. For people, for programs to participate, they, they apply, they respond to a request for applications. And in that initial RFA application, we're already asking um, leadership to think about how will you sustain this after we've left. So they have an initial idea there. We help build that and fill that out through the time that we're working intensively with them. And then before we get to the point where we pull away, we make sure that what they have is an evolved, fine-tuned, usable uh, sustainability plan that is a con uh, continuation of what we've already all been doing together rather than changing gears. Uh, we have lots of other pieces. We have, I just described all the things we do in person. We have a whole other arm of this that is a web-based training that stands in for the knowledge acquisition piece. And then when folks have that knowledge acquisition, the supported practice comes through those ongoing groups that I was talking about. We were running the six months, and then we stepped away. That group continues, and it creates a peer supervision context in which they can continue to learn and build these skills. So, so folks who come in through that route after we've left, due to turnover, due to spreading it through a program or through a hospital, for example, they now have a mechanism that is pretty self-sustaining. Uh, I mean, we have the web-based training, but that's there and they have access to it. And now they have a way to continue to replenish and grow this over time. I mentioned we recertify folks every two years, so it's really important to us that these certifications not just become something that they've achieved and that then they sort of let it drop, but that this is ongoing practice. We've also started certifying agencies because when we made the shift from thinking about individual therapists to thinking about programs, it didn't make sense to have therapists be the only holders of this information, um, of, of the CBT. So instead, we think about the program overall and does it have all this programmatic stuff that we've helped build in, including people who are certified by us in the community um, to be able to do CBT. So we recertify agencies every two years, and then we've done a lot to create a network. I said we've trained 46 programs so far and counting here in Philadelphia. So we don't want to be the only holders of this expertise. We don't want to be sort of the center of the story here. Going back again to the social justice piece, the goal is to take this stuff that sometimes seems very ivory tower and, and like 
hand it to the community where it can grow. And so we do a lot to try to connect the agencies and the programs that we've trained so that they become a supporting network. It's almost like peer supervision on a very large scale. So uh, we have quarterly meetings that are at a central location at, at the Department of Behavioral Health, in fact, uh, so that they can um, so that they can talk to each other, brainstorm around challenges, share successes, share interesting new creative ways to apply some of the skills. We are developing, uh, with Dr. German's help particularly, uh, an e-learning community that's built around the web-based training so that folks don't even need to travel to that quarterly meeting because, as I said, they're either at work, at which point they need to be doing work, or they're, or they're not on the clock at which point they kind of want to go home. So we're looking for ways to facilitate this with less burden. And so this e-learning community gives them an opportunity to be able to access that community from their desk or from home, uh, share successes and ideas. Uh, we still come out every six to eight weeks, even once the, the intensive part is trained and we've stepped back. We still check in about bi-monthly to come in and uh, participate in those ongoing groups that are set up in these different agencies. We do that for a couple of reasons. One is we recognize that people are busy and stressed and that it would be easy to sacrifice the peer supervision if there weren't a little check-in. And, and we know that ongoing supervision is what prevents drift away from the model and it helps continue skill. It's also essential for people who came through the web-based training and need support building the skill. So we really need these groups to continue. We check in every six or eight weeks. Uh, so some of it's there to sort of support that and cheer for the fact that they're still doing it. But we also, when we go out, do things like uh, bring new information and new materials so that uh, if they, we often have groups call us and say, hey, when you're coming out next week, could you talk more about PTSD? Could you talk more about um, older adults? Whatever it is they need, and we bring that out bring materials and other things. We offer advanced topics trainings. and In fact, that's what that intensive supervisor training was, was we just invited everybody from all the trained agencies who was a supervisor to come get some more extended de um, and detailed supervisor training. And then that network of supervisors is beginning to meet through the online learning community so that um, it's, it's a peer group of supervisors from different agencies who are providing peer supervision to each other around supervision and around maintaining this in programs. So as I said, this really, by doing that kind of large context, this moves us from where we have little silos into something where we really have a network across Philadelphia and within a program, we have connection among the silos. Um, We've created an opportunity for consistency for a consumer. We've resolved a lot of that issue about when I go to Mr. Joe, he tells me this, and then when I go to Miss Sarah, she tells me something different. Helps us resolve that. We now have a shared lens and a shared language and a shared way for understanding what we see within the milieu in terms of behaviors and reactions and patterns of thinking from the people receiving services. This also, by the way, um, as I said, it gets infused into documentation and other things. Another sort of unexpected but happy outcome that we're seeing is that we're hearing from folks that this makes things like documentation easier. We work hand in hand with the Department of Behavioral Health and NIAC, who does the audits for them to make sure that notes are in compliance, to make sure that NIAC knows what we're doing and what to look for in notes so that they can cheer for groups as they've come through audits. and. Again, I, I, this sometimes sounds too good to be true to me, but I had recently someone from one of the Journey of Hope programs that we trained come to me and say, we just had an audit recently, and it was so exciting to not be stressed about it. I felt confident and like we were going to be able to show the auditors, NIAC, that we were doing something really valuable here, and that's the feedback they gave us. So there's this, this fits really nicely into the realities of working in the community. A Couple more quick things. I wanna talk briefly about the opportunity that this creates for a continuity of care in the network, because again, we're thinking about the difference between silos and something consistent. So I was saying earlier, this idea of having different disciplines and um, even within disciplines, different ways of having been trained is very confusing for folks who interact with Mr. Joe and Miss Sarah, I think is who I just made up. So on top of that, 
Um, something that happens frequently, more fre much more frequently than it should, is that folks come into, say, one of these programs that we've trained, one of these 46, and they get these services. And when they're close to leaving, they have building skills or, or solid skills that they're really excited about. They have a plan for how to take the next step toward their very meaningful goal. Um, and they're ready, and they move out into the community to the next level of care, and they're back to a silo. They're interacting with whichever provider they're interacting with, but that provider is back to, here's how they were trained, and here's what they do, uh, and where it isn't necessarily CBT. And so part of why I was talking about that network that we're building is that we're very active in working to connect so that referrals go from somebody trained by the Beck Initiative to somebody trained by the Beck Initiative. Now, clearly, consumers have the right to make any decision they want about where they go for aftercare, so there's certainly not something mandated about that. But what we find is that when we say to people, what have you thought of these things that we've been doing here together? How is it working for you? What do you think of going somewhere where you would work with somebody who has the same lens and language? and the same way of thinking about some of the things you've been working on and being able to pick up there and continue with that when you get there. And the large, large majority of the time, not always, but the large, large majority of the time, folks say yes and ask to be connected to aftercare that is trained by Beck Initiative. Some of the no's have to do with the fact that they're, they're, I mean, we've trained 46 agencies, but there's something like 300 in the network, and sometimes there isn't one near them that, that um, is accessible. And there are people who don't experience this to be a great fit, and that's also true. So people may just make the decision that that's not what they're looking for. But it's been really exciting to see how many people experience this and say, yes, I really want more of that thing. Uh, so, so we've been really focused on continuing to build. That's another reason we're connecting people within the network. In fact, just yesterday, uh, Department of Behavioral Health posted something on their website that is a list of all of the providers that we've trained to continue to facilitate this connection among providers trained this way. So great, that's why I said we have a great partner in DBH. So working with folks, taking this goal-oriented approach and thinking about how do I um, take my next step toward the things that really matter to me, and then helping connect them to a provider in the network who has that language and understanding and can help pick that ball up and help the person run with it is a really big piece of the continuity here. Some, trick, some quick training outcomes, because I can't come and present and not have data. It's just how I'm wired. Um, essentially, I, I won't go over each of these, but what this is is that so far we have really good um, training data. What we see is that this is working the way that we hypothesized that it would. People come in, they do the workshop, they start the workshop, they know this much. By, after, by the end of workshop, they know significantly more. Three months into consultation, there's been a big leap and they know even more than that. Six months after consultation, which is when we most often end, 81% um, so, uh, of folks have hit a 40 on the CTRS, sort of the marker of, um, of competency. We have been working with the department to be able to get client level data um, for six years. We got it last week. So we are literally in the process. My team's like applauding. It's very exciting. It's hugely exciting. And so we are in the process of, being, of, of starting to work with those data so that we can talk directly about client level outcomes. I don't have them yet, but stay tuned. Couple of quick slides. The, this first set of, of uh, publications talks specifically about some of the things that we've been talking about here. Talk about the model and uh, the training model and the treatment model and how some of those look. Here are a few others for you to gaze at that are other related publications. And now I have time for questions if anyone has any. Yes, ma'am. So why did you elect to certify individuals yourself instead of having the academy credential there then as the BT provider? It's a question I thought you might ask, and it's an excellent one. I think some of it, so, so to, be, to be really transparent, my first answer is that this program was established about a year before I came on board and, and took the reins. And so I actually wasn't there when the initial decisions were being made. So I'm not entirely positive. But what I'll say sort of for the room is 
that we've had a couple of conversations that were brief about looking at the way that my team is calibrated and the way that the academy is calibrated and looking to see how similar or how different those are because I think that's a really important question. We do a lot, a lot of internal calibration, uh, including with folks who are, who are diplomats of the academy, like Greg Brown, for example, to be able to look at, he's part of our calibration team so that our numbers are consistent with his as well, but it's not, look, it's not the same as looking directly at the two, and I'd like to. What would this community gain mm -hmm. by being part of the academy community? And oh, absolutely. How, how can we, and, and I think there would be a way that we could talk, have a conversation about how to make that happen. I think that that's not only an excellent question, but an exciting opportunity. Um, I think, and I will say that oftentimes there are folks where for, for whatever reason, whether for example they're leaving their agency so they can't be part of this anymore, right. they say I want more of this, how can I do it? And the academy is where we send them. And so that is also a piece, but I would, I would love to look at ways that we could have more than just this very light association and, and have them more connected. Yeah, I think it's really important. Other questions? Getting late? Fair enough. Um, I'm happy to stick around and answer other questions if anyone has them. Otherwise, thank you guys very much. Oh, yes, do you have a question? Please. How do you think agencies find out about what services you provide? Excellent question. So, is the question like, how do they find out about this training that's available? Yeah. Great question. So, we do a lot of community outreach. That's one piece, um, for example. <laughs> Yes and no. So here's what I mean by that. So what I've been talking about in here, I've been focused um, very tightly on the work that we do that is funded by the Department of Behavioral Health. And that does need to be within Philadelphia and the DBH system because it's DBH, CBH dollars. But to sort of talk more broadly about work that we do, we're involved in several states and in many counties besides Philadelphia. The primary difference is that within Philadelphia, the agencies that are selected, the training is paid for by a contract with CBHDBH. Uh, if, it's not, if we're talking to an agency that isn't part of that piece for whatever reason, I mean, I can talk about how they get selected and I, we can do that privately. Um, but when we're talking to a group that hasn't been selected by DBH, CBH for training, then we talk about other ways to fund it. Sometimes we give them a budget and say, here's what's involved, here's the Cadillac version, here's the Toyota version, here's the Yugo version. Um, that's usually the language I use. And then uh, we can also talk about other creative ways to look for funding for folks because dollars are tight everywhere and community mental health especially. Yeah. We also, in terms of how to access the information for what's being funded by DBH, there's an RFA, a request for applications, released every year around it's summer, June, July, August, um, on the DBH website. If you just look where all their RFAs are listed, it will be prominently there. Great question. Yes. Not yet. I think it would be great. And it's needed. Only because um, coming from, you know, where I come from and the frustration that some of us therapists and other people have, because other people don't understand what CBT is, and it works. And if everyone right. was on board, it would work even better. You know, I, I work with a psychiatrist in a medical center, so it, it becomes extremely frustrating for me. I'm the only one with the somewhat of the CBT background. Right. So with all the other social workers, I, I feel like I'm left alone. You know, so it's like a silo. Like a constant, you know, you take care of it, you take care of it. And it's like for them, it's like, well, what is CBT? You know, and they yeah. only because the master program that I was in was CBT focused mm -hmm. only. So this would be great if you can like, implement it in hospitals, medical centers, mm -hmm. especially in house. Um, uh, patient units, mm -hmm. it would work extremely well. Mm -hmm. so that's something to like really think 
Absolutely, and in fact, even when we come in, I should say when we come into groups, especially, well, sort of any time, whether it's been selected by DBH or it's been selected because administration reached out to us, in any group, we'll have the full spectrum of how informed and how enthusiastic people are. So we'll have people who know about it and are excited and love it, and we have people who are much less excited sometimes. Oftentimes it's because they have the CBT myths in the back of their mind, which aren't consistent with the way that we actually practice. So there are a couple of ways that we engage around that. <coughs> Excuse me. So for example, one way to work with that is we'll come in and do, say, a three-day workshop where the goal is to be really transparent about the work that we do and what it looks like and how it can be done creatively and with engagement and motivation and enthusiasm and that it's very resilience and recovery focused and skill building. And we sort of, without pointing at the myths directly, we, we unpack the myths and, and leave folks with a much more accurate and helpful picture of what it is that we do. And often that's one piece of getting engagement from some of those other folks. Sometimes when we come in, either we haven't had that opportunity or there are people who still aren't, aren't are still pretty hesitant. And so what we find there that's really effective is especially this kind of model where we're going in and we start by demonstrating what we do. So we might start by engaging a group that we're training by saying, tell me about the person who's here who's your frequent flyer, who's your person who's here and comes back and comes back and we're feeling frustrated, or a person who has been here for a while and you're worried they won't leave, or they're the most disruptive, you know. And we start with that person, we start training there and start by saying, tell me about them, and start doing case conceptualization on the board while they're talking, where we're just pulling from information and filling it into a case conceptualization. And then we ask about a specific example of a time that was problematic, and use the case conceptualization to have a little bit of a different view to understand why whatever happened might have happened. And then, once we've filled those pieces in, at the end of that day, or that, that unit of training, we might say, Let's talk a little bit about something you might try out between now and the next time we meet, which could even be tomorrow. Um, I wonder what would happen if you tried X and we select an intervention based on the case conceptualization <clears throat> and ask them to come back, ask at least one person to volunteer to give it a try. And when they come back, say, let's talk about what happened. And so we start by demonstrating that it's applicable and meaningful and that is where the final pieces of buy-in come in, are when people see that this really, this really works, that they can be who they are as clinicians and therapists, not whatever myth about you know, like being a rigid or being a robot or all these inaccurate things. They can be who they are as therapists, connect, understand what's going on with someone, and begin to connect with that person to be able to make a difference. And are you slated to go to NCES and North Town State and the prison? In fact, we are. <laughs> what a helpful guided discovery kind of question that is. So we are slated to, in fact, uh, we're getting ready to work with, um, we're meeting with the, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services for Pennsylvania soon. We're uh, working with several state hospitals. I have a meeting with the uh, Secretary of Corrections for Pennsylvania coming up. Oh, data. oh, absolutely, the patient data. So we are, I didn't even get, I gave you the lightest taste yeah. of the data that we have. We actually have lots of data around like burnout and turnover and all kinds of other things. And now that we have access to the data, we're starting to look. The only thing that's kept us from having it was six years of negotiations between the city's attorneys and pens. But now that we've overcome that, we're going to be able to get the data, which is another way to speak to people about, like, because that's really the question in the end, right? Is does this make a difference? And so we can say the initial things we said about people learn it and extrapolate from it based on the literature that if they're doing it and doing it well, we know from the literature that when it's done and done well that it makes a difference. It's different when we can look at specific data, data for an individual client to track them clinically, and data for a population. So we're looking here at the unit at Friends, for example, to look at what did services look like, everything from one-on-one -on -one restraint and um, um, or one-on-one -on -one supervision, sorry, chemical and physical restraint, um, numbers of groups, attendance and participation in group, all of those things. What did it look like in the 12 months before we came, the time that we're here, the 12 months afterwards? So we can look on a program level, we're looking on a network level, we're looking at, so 
yes, we're very, we're very involved in the data. It's just not the path I took in, in this, but yes, yes, data, data are what brings it home. These are great questions, you guys. Anyone else have one? Like I said, I'll stick around if you have a question, but don't want to announce it to the group. That's perfectly fine, too. Thank you guys for coming on a Thursday evening. I appreciate it.